<laughs> hey, what's going on? Welcome to my wacky, wild, crazy setup. I have no idea if this is going to work. I don't know what is happening right now. Um, <laughs> oh, man. We're doing some, some really, really weird stuff. I need to, I need to do a couple of uh, checks just to make sure I'm in good standing here before we can really get started. But I need, I need someone to confirm that uh, everything is honke dore. Um, you might see my... Okay, so my my lip sync might be off, but I am sure that my my audio sounds great. So it's going to be one of those <laughs> sort of nights tonight. Oh, can I see the chat over here? Aha! Let's see if it'll show me the chat. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I got a good topic for us. Records. We're going to talk about records. If this thing pops up. I'm not seeing nothing. All right, let's just, let's just go into it, shall we? See what happens. <laughs> so I have my phone, my tablet, and my computer all working together in tandem to bring you this show tonight. Because I wanted the good sound, I wanted a good camera, and I wanted a good connection. <laughs> so we're melding everything together to make that work for you. So that's the little preamble. I'm just going to launch into the show. If you just let me know, and hopefully we can figure something out. So let's just launch into this. So this is a blog from Discogs. And, oh, that's great. Walter White, right? Walter, he says, the sound is good. That makes me a happy, happy duck. Is it lip synced, Walter? I'm kind of curious. An inch records of all time. Um, a little bit of a preamble, a little bit of a preamble here about this subject. So, incredible sort of vehicle for, like, entrepreneurial capitalism, right? I guess maybe that's the best way Thank you for joining the show. Um, punk rock ca via capitalism. That's what this is. How we do it. Or uh, it sounds good. Walter says it sounds good. I don't want to keep interrupting the show. For this. I'm to see your comments, guys, because of the setup here. Um, this is an interesting notion because we really don't think about, you don't think about punk rock and entrepreneurship. You don't think about punk rock and you don't think about capitalism. But at the end of the day, you know, um, getting your art project together in a way where you can basically self-realize without any gatekeepers to hold you back and tell you, no, you can't do that. How shaking, wagging the finger, the man wags the finger at you and says, no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you can't, you don't know anything about recording a record. You don't know anything about putting out your own record. You need us to front you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever, and you're going to owe us big time, you know, against your royalties and whatnot. And a bunch of bands, you know, really, you know, in the very late 70s and mostly early 80s were like, F that. Oh, man, static in the background. As a static background. Well, shit, my shingles. Check so. I hope that helped a little bit, maybe. <sighs> it is what it is, guys. I can only... It sounds like I'm at the beach. That's so weird. That's probably because I'm doing so much crazy shit. I'll, I'll play it back. I'll listen. I'll see what it's like. I hope it's listenable. That's my main concern. I hope things are listenable. So in any case, you have gate, gatekeepers. They're saying, no, you can't do this. You're not allowed to, you know, put out your own stuff. 
and you have bands with you know these artistic endeavors who basically you know through tenacity and scrappiness and you know the desire to sort of you know get theirs so to speak you know say to hell with it we're gonna do it we'll do this ourselves and they you know book time in a recording studio they call up record companies figure out how to press this stuff up you know they're they're folding and gluing the sleeves that's what the bad brains did with pay to come and that's what the, the misfits did with their records you know uh, sst as well you know you're 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 putting everything together you're overseeing every aspect of the process to uh make your dream a reality what's going on chris berwind how are you um and affectionately it's diy this is what diy is right do it yourself that's the whole point so you know a lot of people are like oh you know don't sell out like capitalism like you know the the anti-establishment in reality i think a lot of these punk bands they are you know kind of a part of the establishment they're just it, th what they are is they're independent they're independently self-realizing and it's like the most beautiful thing you know i've often said that the misfits are a great example of the american dream at work independent entrepreneurial artists creating manufacturing and selling their their wares directly to a fan base and turning a profit in the process you know no matter what danzig says you know that those records were keeping the float, especially in the Sam Hain days, right? I mean, I'm sure Sam Hain must have made some money on the road, but that Plan 9 catalog was was Glenn's bread and butter so much so that he's like, okay, the missiles are dead, but let's let's put out this Legacy of Brutality compilation. I'm sure that was a good seller for him, you know? Um, I'd imagine, at least. So... Let's read what this is. This is from Davy Farchow, posted on September 3rd, 2021, and this is the most expensive punk rock 7-inch records of all time. And this is from the Discogs, from Discogs blog, okay? Now, wh why all that preamble about these 7-inches? Because... Here's the second part. Here's the kicker to everything that I was just saying just now. What these bands did not realize that they were doing is they were essentially creating art. You know, I'm about to get really, like, weird with it, with the, with the terminology, and you may, like, hate me for it, but I'm just going to go for it. You know, everybody talks today about nfts right i've been learning something about nfts non-fungible tokens basically an nft is a digital piece of art that lives on blockchain blockchain technology blockchain is a public ledger that allows one to have essential authenticity and ownership of something that is digital so no matter what copies are made the blockchain says no you have the official copy by being in possession of that blockchain code it sounds enough this sort of mentality has lent oh sorry i just saw these comments what's up mike watson jody ellison and lord stanhope um i'll get to yes crypto 2.0 precisely What's going on, Jody? I have horror. I have a horror bee who came out in Halloween. Glad I got him when I did. Yeah, man, you should be. But here's the thing, and he brings up a good point. Mike does about you know he's glad he got them when he did, because there, there's there's two things to notice here about like this. What, what? Well, first first off, I'm getting ahead of myself. Why am I bringing up NFTs? Why am I talking about blockchain technology when we're talking about seven inch punk records and the reason why i'm talking about those two things in tandem is because the thing about the thing that makes a not an nft so valuable 
is the collectability of it. You know, their limited amount that are pressed up or digitized or whatever the hell they do with them. And it's a collector's thing. It's all about collecting. And it's the same, it's the same principle that came before with Punk Rock 7 Inches. A limited number of these records were pressed up for what for for collectability purposes maybe maybe as a secondary or th- you know even like a a third reasoning but you know definitely in the realm of Glenn Danzig Glenn Danzig knew he was creating collectibles but but mostly for economic reasons these guys did not have enough money to do um, uh, you know multiple crazy pressings of their stuff unless it sold really well I forget what it's called when you do. 500 it's called a batch off a runoff a um a scratch off something like that and basically if you're only pressing 500 records you're not trying to make a profit you're not trying to sell them it's completely for promotional purposes you are handing those out like they're trick-or-treat candy in hopes that you're going to get a record deal but for punk rockers they're going no that's all i can afford is to press up 500. So I'm only going to press up 500. Little did they know that they were creating handheld works of art. It's so weird. When you think about like what... Here, I actually have one as a... Let's use this as a prop, shall we? Here's a 7-inch right here, right? I don't know what it is. The Four Seasons. This is the Four Seasons on a 7-inch. This is like a physical NFT, right? On it, on the actual plastic disc, vinyl disc, sorry, not plastic, vinyl, on this vinyl disc lives music, this intangible thing that lives on a tangible thing, in the same way that NFTs are sort of intangible to us in a weird kind of way. So here's this thing, and um, it's a limited amount, and if I have it in my possession, it's worth something. And I can trade it or sell it or yada, 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 that kind of thing. It's this collectible artwork. Because all of these seven inches are artwork, man. That's how you have to think about it. You can't, like, you know, people get, like, really flustered about, like, how a seven inch could sell for thousands of dollars today. But what they don't realize is it's not a seven inch that's being sold. It's a piece of art. It's a collectible piece of art. That was struck off, stri- strike off. That's what it's called. It's called strike off. That 500 copies is a strike off. It was struck off, and it holds, you know, it, it, it holds, you know, the, the the music on it. But it's art. <laughs> I've said that like a hundred times. What's going on, Zom John, Zombie John? Welcome to the show. Sorry, comments not popping up here. There we go. Jonathan James, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining us. So, got a Canadian single. Sorry, I'm trying to show some comments here. So, I mean, it's it's this stuff fascinates me to no end. Truly, like when you think about it, these guys just they had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea that anybody was going to give a crap decades later, and that their stuff would be worth thousands and thousands of dollars. They were handing these things out. They're just handing them out. Let's read, shall we? The DIY spirit of punk has inspired bands all over the world to start their own labels and release their own records. The ideal format quickly became 7-inch records because they were affordable and the shorter sides complemented the genre's immediacy. That's a good point, too. That's a really good point. No, you're not being from us, Dagger Love. I'm really here. Welcome to the show. Um, yeah, sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point too. The seven inches, you have seven inches or three minutes to, to get your, to get your message out too. So it's like a weird kind of thing. These are like, these are almost like messages for music. They're like messages that contain recordings on them. No, sorry. What I mean to say is they're collectibles that contain messages in the form of music. That's what they are. And they're super duper collectible. So in a way, a 7-inch is almost like a, it's a physical NFT. That's how you have to think about it. And that literally said what I meant to say. Like what literally took me 15 minutes to describe to you, I just said in a single sentence very succinctly. And that's why it's good to do scripted videos instead of just free-balling it live 
on the air and repeating yourself over and over. Thank you. Okay, shut up. <laughs> Talk to myself. Um, many bands design their own sleeves and inserts and then put each record together by hand. So there's also like that, there's that, there's that artisanal craftsmanship, right? Like you're holding this, this thing, you're holding this record that was made and put together by the band themselves. It connects you to the band. You're looking at the art. It connects you to the band. You learn something about the band, you know, um, all in an effort to share their music with people as inexpensively as possible. So why are the records that were made for next to nothing now selling for thousands of dollars? I think we already answered that question uh, about collectability and not understanding and the fact that they're uh, like NFTs. To find the best answer to this question, we explored the database, put together a list of the 30 most expensive pop punk rock seven inches, seven inch records ever sold on Discogs and looked for some common threads. Since sought after seven inches regularly sell for large sums of money, we focused on the highest price paid for each release. For example, the Misfits Cough Cool has sold for $6,500, $7,500, and $10,877. But only the most expensive sale in the marketplace is included in the list below. So this is not just like a fluke. This record has sold for thousands and thousands of dollars multiple times, three times. It was not $20,000 for three records over. You think Danzig thought about that when he was pressing those up? That's why we revel in this shit. That's why we love this story so much. Um, I'm going to sneeze any second. I, I feel it coming on. Like Discog's other most expensive rack, 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 rankings, the popularity of some artists plays a part in the price tag. Well-known punk bands like the Sex Pistols and the Misfits make the list multiple times, but it's not just their notoriety that makes the 7 inches highly collectible. Many of the releases featured here are very rare. One Sex Pistol 7 inch that made the list is rumored to be a limited edition of nine copies, according to the Discogs community. Even though it was released on a major label, this extremely rare release has become the holy grail of Punk 7 Inches and ranks at number one by a $4,000 margin. That is insane. That's absolutely insane. And mind you, you know, I don't know what they, we're just talking about 7 Inches. There was a recently, there was a copy of Legacy of Brutality, a pink Legacy of Brutality, only 16 in existence. And it went for over $20,000. Can somebody look that up? Somebody be my Jamie for a minute. Pull that up. How much How much did that, that pink LOB go for? Let's find out. The Misfits' debut single, Cough Cool, was released on Blank Records, a label started by frontman Glenn Danzig. After releasing only 500 copies, that's the strike-off we were talking about, Danzig traded the Blank name to Polygram, in exchange for studio time, he renamed his label Plan 9 and continued to release Misfits records, including the three different versions of Bullet found on this list that we're about to look at. Joy Division also makes the cut with, with the original pressing of An Ideal for Living. Entering the studio as Warsaw, the band changed their name to Joy Division shortly before the EP's release. These four songs reflect the young group's punk roots and DIY ethic as they released 1,000 copies on their own record label. With cardstock covers folded in four squares, it's often speculated that these were hand-folded by the band. So as we said, when you have a band that is in involved with the manufacturing of the art, of the, it's not just the music, it's not just the art, it's the actual crafting of the, the token itself, in this case a 7-inch vinyl, it just adds to the value, man. It just it sends it through the roof. Um, other rare seven inch, uh, sorry, other rare self released seven inches that make the most expensive list include releases from the Dick Spread, Bad Brains, Big Boys, and Minor Threat. Much like Minor Threat's Discord records, labels like Touch and Go 
formed in an effort to document their local scene. I mean, that's another huge thing we got to look at here. These record labels are not just record labels or businesses, because, you know, each record label, you think of as a business on some, le on some level, but it's also documenting and cataloging the, mu the local music that surrounds that record label. And each record label is usually anchored by some band. Plan 9 Records is The Misfits. Uh, Minor Threat is Discord Records. Touch and Go, you have uh, The Meat Men, right? And didn't Corey Rust... Well, Touch and Go is also a magazine as well. So they formed an effort to document their local scene. Early Touch and Go releases like the Necro Sex Drive 7 Inch and Negative Approaches 10 Song EP are among the top 12 records listed here. While punk outfits from the United Kingdom and the United States often get the most attention, the ranking also includes bands from Japan, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Australia. So this was a worldwide phenomenon of, of doing this sort of thing. Um, oh, that's why. So Lord says it never sold on Discogs. He's referring to the, 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 the LOB. Legacy Brutality, we know that, but it, it sold on eBay, and it's also not a 7-inch, so it doesn't really, it's not going to make the list, but still. Um, Legacy Brutality, no, it was not 6 k It was definitely over $20,000. Definitely over $20,000. Good evening, Amy. Welcome to the show. We're talking about rare punk records. Although I dispute the, I appreciate lord's um attempts here but I, I i dispute his numbers because i i know i think it sold for like 26 maybe 23 i don't know thousand dollars i'm saying twenty three thousand dollars um subway sucks nrk spire is regarded as the rarest punk seven inch in norwegian history the head of Polydor Norway was so offended by the lyrical content that he instructed the AR team to destroy the entire pressing. 25 copies were secretly spared and given to friends, making it one of the most elusive records on the list. Destruction also helped foster cult status of Australia's City Ram, Wa City, City Ram Waddy and the Walking the Dog 7-inch with an initial run of 100 copies. Up to half the pressing was ultimately destroyed due to lack of sales. I mean, two things here. One, I have never heard of any of these records or pressings. It's like kind of crazy. Um, so I'm not really... Are any of you guys familiar with these punk bands I just named? Um, I don't know if it's the best Misfits album. It's not even an album, Dagger. It's a compilation. You can't call it an album. I mean, you can, but it's a compilation. It's not an album. Sorry. <laughs> That was very nerdy. Uh, Amy agrees, though. It's the, the best record. You could say it's the best record, but you know, best out. it's not an album. Um, it's definitely got its own cohesive, unique sound, that's for sure. I used to, man, I, I came up on Legacy of Brutality before Static Age, before any of the others. Matter of fact, I think Legacy might have been my first, no, Misfits Collection 1 and then Legacy <laughs> on CD unfortunately. Japan's Gas and A-Bomb also find themselves on the list with limited edition flexi-discs. A flexi-disc, uh, a format which has recently made quite a comeback. So a flexi-disc is this crazy type of, of, of disc that can be played in vinyl. It's, um, it's basically a, a plastic flimsy disc that, you know, you can bend, right? You can really bend it and it has the grooves, and you can play it on, on a player. Um, but the sound is not going to be really solid because of the, the grooves, and it's just not a very, you know, stable way to play, you know, a vinyl-style recording. But flexi-discs are, they're like more, they're a novelty. You know, th like the actual practical purpose of a flexi-disc was, you know, in Time Magazine in like the 70s or 60s, you know, a sample of a song or on the back of a, you know, inside a, a cereal box, you know, free, free 
recording with, you know, your sugar, sugar crispies, you know, kind of crazy, kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah. Do you have any of the pricey, uh, do you have any of the priciest punk seven inches in your want list or collection? View the list below to find out. Uh, author's note, the release page for Sex Pistols God Save the Queen shows $17,123.29 as the highest sale price. Um, as this sale was not completed via Discogs, our, or, our article references the highest completed sale price at $14,591.44. Sale price data is subject to change as exchange rates fluctuate. So the price you see in the list below may vary from uh, the statistics in the database. All prices are in U.S. dollars. So it's really seventeen grand. But even still, I, I'm telling you, that that um, legacy of brutality most certainly, uh, what's it called, trumps that. It definitely is not, it's, it's definitely somewhere in the 20s. So, and you know, that's the other thing too. It seems that, that, that punk vinyl is the vinyl that's most collected, maybe metal vinyl too. But when you think about seven inches, it's punk seven inches, man. I mean, yeah, you can look at like the Beatles and stuff, but people want punk seven inches. That's what it is all about. How's my mic sounding, by the way? It is a eclectic album, Dagger Love. I do agree. Legacy of Brutality is collect is eclectic. I don't know if it's an it's not an album though. It's a compilation. And yes, yes, you used to get it. You used to get your flexies in your cereal. That's right. Um, let's take a look. So number 30, City Ram Waddy, Walk the Dog, $2,334. We, we talked about that already. Number 29, Gas, No More Hiroshima. That's from Japan. That's a flexi 7-inch for 2300 Number 28, Tierveet Cadet at twenty four hundred fifty dollars, two thousand four hundred fifty dollars. Number twenty seven, Agnostic Front, United Blood, nineteen eighty three. Um, Agnostic Front self released. There's not a label. Um, this is two thousand four hundred fifty one dollars. Minor Threat in My Eyes, nineteen eighty one, twenty five hundred dollars on Discord Records. Uh, number 20, sorry, that was 26. Also at 25 is the same record, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. Number 24, The Vomit Pigs. Take one. Never heard of The Vomit Pigs. Okay. That's also 2,500. Number 23, Subway Suck, NRK, AE Spire. That's at $2,568. We've got, uh... Crowd favorite, number 22, Misfits, Night of Living Dead. So, Night of Living Dead, $2,739. You know what's funny? I remember 10 years ago, I remember 10 freaking years ago when all of these Misfit records, no, it was unheard of that a Misfit record would sell for over, you know, this was like 2010, 2011. No Misfits records sold for over uh, $1,000, except... Maybe a bullet, and cough cool. The highest cough cool went for was two thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars was mind boggling at the time. And now, in ten short years, everything is appreciated. And you know, one might say that we're in a bubble right now, and that could be true. We might be in a bubble, but <laughs> it's a good bubble to be in. No, I don't think so, man. I think they're going to keep appreciating. I think it's the type of thing. It's in limited quantity, you know, as these bands die out and become more and more legendary, the value is only going to increase. Owning, I feel like like owning 7 Inches is, is a solid investment, uh, especially if they're in good condition. You have the big boys, frat cars. Big boys used to play with the Misfits. 
played with the Bad Brains too, although the Bad Brains and the Big Boys had some had some problems. And that goes for five dollars under three grand on their label, Big Boys Records. You have Atomic Bomb, Hell Story. Not familiar with Atomic Bomb. That also goes for just shy of three thousand dollars, a dollar a dollar shy of three thousand dollars, self released. Reign of Terror, Don't Blame Me, $3,000. I mean, see, you know what's so funny? It says not on a label, not on a label, not on a label. This is what filmmakers should be doing with their independent films right now. All filmmakers should be like me. I'm the perfect guy for this. This is what I should be doing. You don't need to go to Netflix. This is what you need to do. You press up your own shit, and the people that are interested are going to buy it. And when it sells out, it's, it's sold out. And you create something rare in that kind of way. Whether it's good or bad, whether the, the art stands on its own or doesn't, that works. Um, number 18, Misfits Bullet, now going for $3,000. Another bullet, that's number 17, for $3,033. Remember, these are the top 30 most sold, most expensive punk 7 inches. So it's not necessarily a market price, per se, but it's just what the market, what everything sold for in that market. Number 16, Babies, Duana Love, $3,042. Number 15, Vicious Visions, I Beat You No-Nos. That went for $3,151.75. Number 14, Dicks, The Dicks Hate the Police. Off of Radical Records. That's $3,200. Number 13. Here's a big one. Sex Pistols. NLK in the UK. For $3,424.66. That's off on EMI. Um, Winston says, let's see if this pops up. Strange 7 inch would cost so much. Punkers don't want to spend a dime. But that's my point. You know, the people who are buying these, some of them are punk fans, but most of them, you know, punks are not necessarily buying punk 7 inches. Music collectors are buying punk 7 inches, you know. Punks, punk rockers in punk bands are making this stuff. This is their art, and it's highly sought after. It's highly sought after and collectible. But that's how you have to view it. You can't look at it as just a, a container of music you have to look at it as as you know value valuable art Ooh, sorry vinyl is all about collecting that's right roman says i want to buy the misfits halloween seven inch there's a couple floating around on ebay and you should you should if you have the if you have the dough to buy it and you know i don't have the disposable income to be investing in vinyl like this Especially because, you know, to liquidate is a shame. That, see, that's the flip side to all this. You know, to, to liquidate means that you have to part with the piece. It's not like you can sell shares or interests of the thing. It's like a, it's a thing, right? It's a thing. So, you know, it, it, you, you don't break this off and it's still valuable. It's like, oh, I'm going to liquidate the thing for money. Um, and that, that's, that's, a, in a pro, that's a process all... All its own, you know. It's kind of like it's kind of like owning a house. It's kind of like having equity in a house, right? Like you have to, you have to. Um, holy shit! We have a winner, winner, chicken dinner, real quick. Chris didn't even know he he's got the dicks. You have this record, Chris. You have dicks. The dicks hate the police. Like an original copy of that. If so, it's worth three thousand two hundred dollars. That's really cool. If that is the case, please confirm for us. Uh, Rue laments that he bought an Evil Live and a November Coming Fire, both colored vinyl for 30 bucks. Oh, never mind. He's not lamenting. He is um, sharing with us that he bought Evil Live and November Coming Fire for 30 bucks. Th those are great investments, Rue. And, you know, we, you and I both know that those have definitely appreciated in value. But that's my point is that, like, you know, it's one thing to buy the record. It's another thing to buy it at a really cheap price and watch it appreciate in value. It's another thing to liquidate. Liquidating is a problem. It's hard to liquidate a record. You know, you have to go on Discogs. It's not hard per se, but there's, there's a lot involved and there's no guarantee. It's just like a house. It's just like owning a house. 
There's no guarantee that you're going to get a specific price for a house. You know, to, down to the point where you need brokers for this sort of stuff. And there most certainly are brokers that exist in the record collecting world for sure. But, you know, you don't think of a, of a seven inch broker as in the same way that you might think about a, realita a realtor or an agent. And that's what's interesting about it. Rue says that he would never sell. And I, I respect that. I'm in the same boat as you. I've, uh, you know, you know about my initium, my first parsing of initium, and I never plan to sell it unless, unless it comes down to feeding my children or something like that or saving my house or whatever, then I would sell it. Number 12, Opus, Good Procedures and the Atrocity. I don't know this, another band I don't know. $3,500, that's on Catatonic Records. Number 11, Necros, Sex Drive. $3,800. That's on Touch and Go from 1981. Unbelievable. Number 10, Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen at $3,852. Uh, $3, Freaking um, off of Virgin uh, from the country of South Africa. That is, that is interesting. Very interesting. I can't pronounce this one. Number 9 is Ikashi... Ikashinju, Dead Section 3, from 1988. This one goes for a, a, a buck under $4,000 on premium records out of Japan. You know? Um, Roman says, yeah, bro, some albums are priceless. I agree, man. Some albums are priceless. Number eight, The Fingers, Sol Solation. Again, I don't know these records. $4,000. Number seven, The Queers, Love Me. Is that the Queers, like with Joe Queer? Yeah, Joe Queer. Look at that. Look how many songs. He's got five songs on a 7-inch. That goes for $4,000. I wonder if that's their first record. It's from 1982. Love Me. Number six. This is an iconic record. I own a knockoff of this record. See, I love the art. It's like, you know, owning a bootleg is almost like, it's like owning a reproduction of the art. You want to own it. I don't, you know, I don't even necessarily always play them. I just love looking at them and holding them and just having them. I like collecting them. I like looking at them when they're all consolidated and together, you know. And I, one of those records is Pay to Come by the Bad Brains. It's with the back side, the, the, the B side is Stay Close to Me. Phenomenal songs. And this was, I know that this one was folded and stitched together by the Bad Brains themselves. So... There's that. And that's on Bad Brains Records. $4,494.16. So here's that Joy Division at number five. Joy Division, an ideal for living in 1978. $4,794.52. My lord. Lordy, lord, lord. That is a lot. Can I see what's under here? There we go. Number four, Negative Approach. I love this cover with the Exorcist on it, um, with uh, Pazuzu Reagan. Negative Approach, Negative Approach. This is also touch and go, $5,499. Just shy of $5,500. Again, I'm sure Glenn, Glenn Danzig loved this record, right? Number three, Misfits Bullet. This one's from 1979, so this is a second pressing for $7,495 off of Plan 9 Records. Now, the second pressing that, that came out in 1979, maybe this is the third, this could have even maybe even been a third pressing. Might have had two pressings in 78. I don't know. No, no, no. Second pressing, 1979. Uh, I This I do know. The, the back cover, it says Better Dead on Red, which is a take on Better Dead Than Red, which is... You know, pejorative, we don't want to, it's better to be dead than to be a commie. That's, that's what the, it's taken from. Number two, this just happened very recently, and we were all, this happened last year, all of us, our jaws hanging down as we watched this record uh, being sold. Although I could have sworn it was on eBay. Maybe there was another one on eBay that sold for a similar price. I think eBay set the precedent for maybe this being sold. Because I remember that maybe, I think that there was one on eBay that went for $11,000 or maybe even more. Misfits, Cough Cool with, with She, man. My God, $10,877 for a, one of 500 records. Actually, 
even rare because we were talking about earlier about like destruction. You know, a hundred of those records were destroyed in, in a fire in Manny's basement. Number one, Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen, listed here at $14,591 on A&M Records, but we know that the uh, that there was a higher price at seventeen grand. Ain't that a motherfucking biznatch? That's crazy, man. That is just insanity to me. I don't know. But, um, so there you have it. There you have it, folks. Um, records are a funny thing. They're definitely a funny thing. And, you know, like I said, I think that ultimately it's records that that kind of hold the future, you know, um, in, you know, making your own stuff. You don't need to get distribution through, you know, you don't need to get distribution. You, you can put together the money yourself and make the thing and put it out yourself, you know, just like they did in the olden days. Rue says, take a look at these last comments here. Rue says, now I lament, lament. My mom threw out my cough cool and many more favorites. So Rue had a cough cool that potentially is worth tens of thousands of dollars today. Michael just wants to stop by and say hello. Mike, thanks for stopping in and saying hello. Hope, hope all is well by you. Catalyst99 says, shouldn't Misfits Night of the Living Dead be on that list? It sure is. You just missed it. It's up earlier in the list. Forget what number, but it's it's there. It is there. Um, thank you. I try to say, <laughs> yeah, DIY for the win. Exactly. Exactly. I, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, so I, I, I come from the filmmaking community, the indie micro-budget horror filmmaking community. That's who I am, that's who I was, and that's who I am before any of this other, this YouTube stuff or any of the other things I attempt to do. And the thing that we all struggle with is trying to find a way to make money for our art. And it's just... The only way I think to really do it is to just go out and, and make it and put it out yourself. You know, press up a bunch of copies. I'll tell you, anything that I put out, that's how I'll do it from now on. You don't need, you don't need the, all it is, all, you know, getting those distribution deals and Netflix and stuff, you don't make any freaking money, bro. You don't make any money at all. It's just, it's just validation it's, it's external validation to show your peers, oh, look, I got a distribution deal. Same thing with a record deal. Would you rather be signed to a major label or would you rather be not working a day job because you're selling enough music out of the trunk of your car after a show? That's a very 90s thing for me to say. But, like, you, you get my point? It's even easier now with the Internet. There's just no, there's no excuse. What's up, crazy white boy is in the house. Glad you're enjoying the topic. Um, Jarmy says, damn, you had me with things other than sugar plums slam dancing on my brains. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. Oh, Catalyst, Catalyst, you really need to, Catalyst guy, you, you need to go back and listen to the episode, buddy. We talked about this. We talked about, I must have brought up the pink vinyl several times. I'm not going to repeat myself again. But we definitely covered it. Go back, listen to the episode. It's a great episode. And if you want to jump in the conversation, make sure to subscribe, turn on your notifications, and most of all, smash that subscribe button. I know that's such a cliche thing to say, but it really does help uh, drive the video up in the algorithm. Also, you know, for those of you who have not seen, I did, I uploaded the uncut version of my film, Romeo's Distress. Perfect example of what we're talking about here. You know, for a while, my film was on Amazon Prime, and it was really cool, and it was cool to be able to say and show people that, I, hey, my film was on Amazon Prime. It was very, it's very easy to get your stuff on Amazon Prime. But the reality is, is I wasn't making any money. Not that I'm making much money now, but I find it ironic that I make more money on YouTube from people watching my film for free than any money that I ever made from the royalties I received from Amazon, where it was like, it was like 15 cents for every hour watched. It just, it's bullshit, man. 
It's just bullshit. So I said, fuck it. I put up the entire film uncensored. I was trying to leave some sort of exclusive exclusivity. I, I threw caution to the wind. I wanted to see if the algorithm would pick it up. So you can go and watch my film right now on the internet. It's the equivalent of... of <laughs> it's not the equivalent, I was going to say. It's the equivalent of pressing up your own thing and selling it. It's not. But the the the... You know, the motivation is similar. The motivation is similar. I want to self-realize, self-actualize myself. I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to wait for anybody to tell me what for. Um, we got some exciting projects in the works. Some of the stuff is distracting me from my YouTube. Uh, I can't say anything about it until after it's complete. Um, that includes the stuff that I was working on over the summer that I couldn't talk about. Uh, what else can I tell you? Oh! If you missed it, we had some serious technical difficulties at certain parts, but please check out the, the first episode of Sinful Celluloid with uh, Christopher Jimenez. Um, we have episode two is coming this Thursday. We will be discussing uh, our favorite horror eras for film. So, or sorry, our favorite eras for horror films, I should say. Uh, and we'll be arguing about it and doing all that. This is going to be a regular thing. He picked the topic this week. I'm going to pick the topic next week. Come and join in the conversation. Um, and on Wednesday, we should have a, a, a Lodi Misfits streaming Evil Live show. Um, more on that real soon. Keep your eyes peeled for many more treats. Going to record that November coming fire video is going to be recorded. I just wrote a bunch of notes after uh, doing some preemptive listening to November coming fire. Um, so that's all going to be fun. Very interesting stuff coming up. I don't know what else to tell you, what else I can say, except, that's right, Cheesecake of Love, man. Cheesecake of Love. I should put that on a 7-inch. It was a cheesecake of love. I wrote that song. That song, that's my song, my original song. You know, I was thinking about shooting a music video for, uh, something new, which is a song that I recorded. It's a cover of a from a band called The Yokes, but it's, you know, it's, I, I did all the singing and uh, engineered the vocal stuff, and I my friend Nick, he played all the instruments, and we had a lot of fun making that. In an hour or so, I'm gonna be at your door, so put your pants and shoes on, cause baby, we's about to lie. We recorded it like three years ago, but I've been wanting to do a music video for quite some time. No, three years ago. Two years ago? One year ago? I don't know. Um, that's it. That, I think that's the end of the show. Um, please check out the Patreon or join here. You can join membership here on YouTube. Um, one or the other. Check out the t-shirt shop. I've got a lot of t-shirts. Help fund, keep the engine going. Um, yada, 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 all that good stuff. Hey, Rue, thanks so much for, for dropping in and uh, joining us. Rue is kind of like the you know, if, for anybody who watched the Howard Stern show, I feel like Rue is my Fred or my Jackie. He's in the comments. He he hangs out in the wings, and he just sort of leaves comments, and he's always there for every show, and I appreciate him. So I tip my hat to Rue Mork, and that's it, guys. So uh, I'm going to listen back to this stream. Um, I'd love any feedback about how you felt this stream went, truly. All your feedback helps. That's really the end of the broadcast. And we say peace and hair grease.